Michael Gordon. Now, Michael is a fifth gen Aikido instructor as well as a psychotherapist. And Michael's talk today is transcending trauma, so moving from reactivity, anxiety, and aggressivity to enlightened daily living. I'm very pleased to be here. As Mina was uh, saying in her introduction, I'm a, a psychotherapist here in Vancouver and have been for relatively the last decade. And I am dressed quite out of context uh, <laughs> to the history of this theater in a lot of ways, although it is a theater. Um, in a uh, formal Aikido uniform or outfit, uh, gi, it's called Aikido gi. So this would be for gradings or uh, formal occasions. And I've got a couple of my students uh, here who have generously donated their time to uh, be a part of a short demonstration uh, towards the end of the talk today. So um, I've titled my talk, Praxis Bold as Love. And um, in the process of putting this uh, slideshow together, I found out that one of my favorite quotes, which you probably come across on the internet, uh, which is falsely and misleadingly attributed to Jimi Hendrix, actually goes back in not the most appealing way to the Victorian British Prime Minister William Gladstone. But nevertheless, it's a great quote. And for a somewhat liberal Prime Minister in the Victorian context, um, what Gladstone was trying to get at is very apropos. And that is, when we start to embrace the power of love over the love of power, we'll have enduring peace. And so that's why I have Jimmy up there. And as well, if you're familiar with Jimi Hendrix music, he's kind of a personal hero of mine. He famously made an album called Axis Bold as Love. So um, what is praxis? Well, praxis is something that I'm looking at um, in uh, the philosophy of education program where I'm a doctoral student at SFU. And uh, really what it is is looking at where my areas of practice overlap uh, from the counseling space, the Aikido space, which I'm going to talk about, and generally speaking, teaching. But teaching isn't just in the formal pedagogical context. Teaching is life. We're all teaching each other, teaching each other how to treat each other and how to be. And hopefully the mission of Aikido is to teach each other how to be more of who we really are to really feel the limitlessness of who we are. So um, critical education or critical pedagogy theorist, Paulo Freire, his way of explaining Aristotle's idea of praxis, which was basically to be a model citizen in, in ancient Greece, in Aristotle's ethical theory, was not just to sort of in the individualistic model, just make the most you can of your life. The idea was to cultivate yourself in various ways, in ways of thought, in ways of communication, in ways of relationality, and in, in ethical ways, in ethical action, because it built the whole of society. It enabled others to also be the most that they can be towards an enlightened society. That was the idea. And so his theory was updated by Paulo Freire that there's reflection and action go together. And sometimes you'll hear praxis defined as theory and action, um, or theory and practice going together. But the idea is ultimately what happens in the end and how well it works and what we learn from that. The doing is what's important. And that's very vital to the talk that I'm giving today. One of my other personal heroes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who famously said, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. And that really is at the heart of what Aikido is about. And again, I'll explain that more as we go along. Why is this talk called Transcending or Transforming Trauma? Well, as a therapist, and as a therapist who specializes in a trauma uh, therapy approach, uh, I, I got clinically trained in something called EMDR, it's eye movement therapy. And basically what it's doing is it's unlocking, much like T was talking about the unconscious and our dream state, all the associative processes of our brain, which is still the mystery of the brain, all the complexity of what the brain is, will hold information in that sort of meaning-based and state-based way. And so we all kind of have heard of post-traumatic stress and the effects of post-traumatic stress. Well, you don't actually have to endure a capital T major trauma to be holding on to um, a post-traumatic effect. In fact, one in 10 Canadians have um, had some sort of mental health incident and perhaps even beyond that had a quite a traumatic, post-traumatic experience that they may have never sought treatment for. So what that means is, and what I say to my clients is, 
when they walk in and they're confused about what it is I'm gonna do with them in therapy because they're not functioning to the height of their um, full functioning ability, is when's the last time you had a cold? And often people say, oh, I don't remember. Three months ago, four months ago? Well, because you're not sick anymore. But as you know, when you have a cold, you just want someone to come and put you out of your misery. You can't remember what it was like to breathe properly and you're just praying for your cold to be over. So we've adapted in that way to, um, to be able to, to handle that kind of a experience. Sickness is part of the continuum of our, ex of our experience over our lifetime that we adapt to. And it's just a normalized experience because it's something that happens when we're young. So when we're overwhelmed, and the experience hasn't left us, and particularly when it's entered in, in an overwhelming, traumatic kind of way, particularly when you're most vulnerable, when you're a child, it stays with you, and it stays with you in multiple ways, in your nervous system, in your meaning structure, and so much like when you're in the middle of a cold and you can't remember what it's like to be healthy, when you are functioning from or dysfunctioning from held trauma, it's as if the, the experience never ended. And there's one uh, person in the United States who wrote an article online uh, describing it as a nightmare that's still happening. It never resolves. You wake up and the nightmare's still happening. Okay, so hopefully you visit uh, T's workshop this afternoon and tap more in a positive way, in a proactive way, into your ideal um, state of consciousness, dreaming or awake, okay, rather than being functioning from a nightmare. So that's the therapy side of things. Um, a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. So a big theme of the talk I'm giving today and what you'll see in the demonstration of Aikido is the interspace. So we are, we've inherited, depending on who you talk to, let's say about a 100,000 year old evolutionary design of our brain. And so we are functionally still very much animals. Um, the lizard brain is kind of an outdated term, but you know that when you get startled, or you get really run down, or you're in a shock situation, that you revert back to the limbic system reaction, which is the mid organs of the brain. And the brain is kind of like a map of our evolution. We started out with basic consciousness, temperature, hunger, um, you know, the basic kind of stimulation of, of survival. And then as we evolved and life got more complex, we had more check-ins and more balances and more regulatory processes. Well, the mid part of your brain is sort of the the, the playground of that aspect of our neurological development. That's called the limbic system. So this is the so-called fight, flight, or freeze center. And the idea being that um, we are still very much in a, in a set point, in a state of normal responsiveness, by default, always scanning for threat. And this is why without cultivating ourselves in the kind of way that Aristotle was looking at in terms of as citizens, as human beings in a humanizing kind of way, thinking about our relationships and thinking about evolving socially and emotionally, that we, when pushed, we revert back to this limbic responsivity, uh, reactivity, fight, flight, or freeze. And we all do it in different ways. So if there was suddenly someone here heaven forbid, to fall over from a heart attack, some people would panic and just, I don't know what to do. Some people might just say, I'm going to go outside, and, and some people might get really agitated. Okay? And we all experience this in our daily lives, the way we handle stress. The problem is, once the stress has happened, it's too late. And so trying to uh, respond once the fire is burning down the house with cups of water, rather than having planned the wiring in your house so it didn't burn down in the first place, that's kind of the analogy. And so the talk today is trying to at least get to this idea of how can we get in there on a subconscious level and on, so that in our habits of communicating and relating, we're not so reactive. This is one way. This is the spirit, again, of Aikido to move from um, self to losing yourself through service to others. So Descartes famously said, Cogito ergo sum, which means I think, therefore I am. Okay, so that's not just about basic consciousness. It's the idea that I am some kind of separate, uh, substantiated being. And so this sort of sets up this idea of that there's a little person in there driving you, watching this whole theater of consciousness happen. 
And this has been called the homunculus, the little person or man inside of us. The problem with this model is, let's just say, yeah, okay, so there's some watcher inside. Who's watching the watcher? And so this sets up a kind of a logical philosophical issue because if there's someone watching the watcher, then there's someone watching the watcher, and it goes back into what's called infinite regress. It's not a very good model for consciousness. Now, this may have been used by other people, but it's something that I put together for this talk. Hopefully I'm not just repeating something that's generally out there and well known, not to my knowledge. And that's what we might call concordia ergo sum, and that is by being connected, by being with, by being part of the whole I am. This image was very carefully selected. It's an image that was downloaded from an, uh, an artist, a photographer named Anthony G uh, Giacomino, who I don't know, but I just found the image and I loved it. And what the image is is of a, a spider web with droplets of water. But what the image represents is a, a very ancient Hindu Vedantic and uh, middle way um, what's called Mahayana, Mahayana Buddhism um, concept, which from the Mahayana Buddhism uh, teaching of emptiness. And this mythology is called Indra's net of jewels, or the jewel net of Indra. And the idea is, is that as a, as a metaphor, as an image of the universe, there's a net, and the net is held together by jewels. Each corner where the net is intersect is held by jewels. So each jewel represents all the other, or pardon me, reflects every other jewel in the net. So rather than infinite echoes of ourselves watching ourselves like a bad photocopy of a photocopy, we have an infinitely, simultaneously reflecting image of everything. <laughs> this is my dog, Sam. Uh, why did I put my dog in there? Well, there's probably not time in this talk, but um, having a dog and looking at working with a, with a dog in the same way changes the whole relationship to um, building, building a relationship and, and what you want from that relationship with a dog, especially a big dog like this who's very willful. But dogs are socially bonded much like any other animal. And so if you take a very aggressive, very reactive, domineering approach with a dog, they don't bond and they don't trust you. The heart of this talk is based on this image that went viral in the last two weeks. I don't, how many people here raise your hand and saw this image on social media or on Huffington Post It went viral? This is a photograph taken by somebody, I, I don't know, I forgot the fellow's name. Um, it was posted online and the fellow on the left had uh, been disturbing everybody on the Sky Train in Vancouver somewhere. Out of control, clearly with some kind of um, mental illness problem and um, being quite uh, disruptive and, and scary, aggressive. The woman on the right, who's in her 70s, I believe, instinctively reached her hand out and held his hand. And the moment she held his hand, he relented. He softened and he sat down. And they interviewed the woman and said, why did you do that? She said, I'm a mother. And you needed someone to touch. That's the power of human compassion and empathy. I don't recommend you do that. <laughs> she was in a particular position to do it and a non-threatening person and just, but the spirit of fearlessness with which she did that and melted the situation is phenomenal. That echoes a, a very famous story in Aikido about an American practitioner who went over to Japan, was on a train, thought, Somebody was being drunk and belligerent on the train, a worker, and he thought, well, I'm gonna be Aikido man and take care of the situation, this Westerner. And before he could leave into action, he heard this voice of a little old man sitting off on the side of the train. He said, excuse me. And this big drunken guy said, yeah. And he said, do you like sake? And the fellow said, well, yeah. And so the long of the story, the sh short of the story is, convinced him to come over and sit down. He said, oh, my wife and I like to drink sake in the afternoon. And he had some sake, and he poured him some sake, and the guy started to calm down. And he proceeded to tell this old man, I've uh, just lost, lost my job, and I'm ashamed to go home and tell my wife, because my whole world's gonna fall apart. And then he started to sob. And then he fell asleep on the old man's shoulder. That's Aikido. 
Um, I've got to take, take up too much time with this, but just because it's such a short talk and I want to get a bit of a demonstration. There's a famous study of orphans who, um, orphans who were in, uh, in despicable, deplorable conditions of deprivation at the end of Ceausescu's reign in, in uh, Romania, 1987. And so they were malnourished, they were uh, abandoned, and of course they were in emotional and physical distress. Well, a team uh, from Harvard University followed these orphans when they were um, brought into the United States for 12 years. And uh, what they found was that as they were brought back into better um, conditions, um, and they did brain scans over the period of years, they were able, first of all, what they detected at the early stages was a, a lessening of cortical mass in the brain. So in other words, the part of your brain that goes with social and emotional learning and intelligence was, uh, was, was underdeveloped in these children because of the emotional abandonment. But after a period of 12 years and healthy attachments and connection and of course obviously material support and food and shelter, et cetera, but the love and the protection, their brains restored themselves. So there's kind of a, what I call neural relational plasticity there that can occur even in the worst conditions, neuronally, to brain anatomy. Oh, I went too fast. Uh, very quickly, studies very early on of primates show us that it was the social connection and grouping and the protectiveness of the social organization of higher primates that allowed longer gestation period. So safety means longer gestation period, which means the, that, that species can evolve. And that's how we have a bigger prefrontal cortex because of the social organization. What is Aikido? This is the founder of Aikido. His name is Morei Ushiba. And uh, his mission was not just to be the best martial artist in the world, but it was to harmonize the human family. It was to take martial arts and turn them into a praxis of love. What does that mean? Oh, pardon me. Uh, it means, quoting Ushiba, that when an enemy tries to fight with me, the universe itself, he has to break the harmony of the universe. Hence, the moment he has the mind to fight with me, he's already defeated. There exists no measure of time, fast or slow. The idea of Aikido in, this, in a nutshell is that you're protecting the space in which you both exist. It's as, it's as precious and as, um, and as uh, deserving of love and protection as any other aspect corner of the universe. Everything is contained in that relationship. So it's not to destroy or to defend yourself. It really embodies the spirit of evolving ourselves out of separateness and other, away from Descartes' idea, idea of I am me. This is a famous picture of Steven Seagal very early on before he became his own Aikido personality, uh, being a student trying to lift the founder of um, key Aikido, which is a more energetic study of Aikido, um, uh, Koichi Tohei. And Tohei uh, was very small, diminutive person. And this is a picture of Seagal, who's, I don't know, 6'5 or something. Can't lift him off the ground because he's so relaxed. I'm going to show you in a moment. So yin and yang. So in Aikido, you represent the center, and you're protecting the, the balance of yin and yang. Yeah? This is our club in South Granville. And you see I'm there attacking my teacher, very foolishly. And as I move around, he keeps the space of yin yang and I have to escape to protect myself. So he gives me the option of what to do. I'm gonna show you now, very quickly, because at the end of my talk, if you wanna come up and invite my students up here, what that looks like. You can give them a round of applause. If okay. okay, so stand back a bit here. So if they hold me, they're not trying to be super aggressive and prove anything. We're not fighting, because that's just reality and it would be a vicious battle. Aikido is not a sport. So when we train, we train with a seriousness about it, not to see you know, who's got the best moves. Ultimately, it would be one lives, one dies. We can't train that way. But we can train with that feeling. So they give me something to deal with. And so they're holding me with a lot of coordination of mind-body. Okay. So if I struggle, I know even if I try to use physical strength, I'm struggling. What I want to be able to do is take their energy and have that yin-yang circle move. Yeah? So, 
I feel one direction moving, and I line up, and I move. Whoop, there we go, and off they come. All right, uh, let's try something else. Uh, we'll go this way first. Okay. So here I am, they're holding me side, each side, okay? And it, they're holding me quite strongly. So if I try and pull, just to show you, it's a struggle. I can move, but it's not moving effortlessly, and I'm not getting them to agree, okay? So what I want to be able to do is move and have them follow. Okay. So I get the movement going, and they're following, and we move back and down. Okay. And now they just attack. Because there's no reactivity. Do you understand? So if he comes to hold and I wrestle with him, the energy comes back to me. I don't have a lot of room here to, to make to project and do any throws, unfortunately. Okay? But if they both come to hold now, if you come from here, David, and Calvin comes here. And they're done. So I stay in the center, and the problem resolves itself. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sophie. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Um, if you want to find out more about EMDR, you can go to my website. You can come talk to me and um, our Aikido organization. But it's just an introduction to this idea of how to work on yourself to improve uh, your relations in your daily life. And again, to sort of evolve our social brain uh, from this inherited model. Thank you very much.